I, I, I can't tell you what a privilege it is for me to be here with you. But it's a privilege I almost turned down when I was invited because I was quite intimidated by the fact that you were all born long after I retired from the Army. And I thought, what in the world would I have that would be relevant to you? What could I tell you? And then my wife of 57 years, my ring figure date, reminded me of something that I tried to preach throughout a good bit of my adult life. And that's the shared responsibility that all of us have. I share it with you, you share it with me, we share it with each other, of mentoring, of passing on the lore of what we know to those who follow us or those who are on our right or our left. It's a fundamental aspect of leadership, passing on what we know, what we've learned. And that brings me to maybe the most important point that I will make. When you get to the point in your life where you're going to select your life's partner, I suggest you find someone who is smarter than you are and not afraid to call you out when you need to be called out. So here's to my ring figure date, who in November of uh, 1968, 67, 60, 60, 65. Put, put this ring on my finger in, in, the, in the rose trellis in that great uh, VMI tradition. But I, want, I don't want to make this a, this is not a formal presentation. Uh, because there are, there are semesters long courses in crisis communication. Uh, there are libraries full of books on the subject. And I can't replicate that. But what I can share with you is some of the things that I picked up along the way that I learned that if I were with you individually or in small groups at a bar someplace over a beer that I would want to tell you. Because the best mentoring in the world sometimes occurs over a beer at a bar. Believe me, believe me. And I will pass that on as something that you should look to do when you get to that point where you have other people that you want to mentor. So I guess one of the first things that I want to tell you a little bit about the media. I don't want to dwell on the media because communications, this very human function that we have, communications is, 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 a, is a very personal thing. Yes, you may be in a situation where you're going to be dealing with the media. That's its own ball of wax. Uh, but communication is also how we all relate to one another in intimate relations, in vast public relations. Don't disrespect the media. And by that I mean there are very professional men and women doing the journalism business who are trying very hard to get the story straight. It doesn't, it, that doesn't mean that there aren't others who have their own agenda. But when you are given the mission of speaking to reporters you must enter that relationship assuming that they are professional until they prove Otherwise, I think that's a very important mindset to, to have from the, from the beginning. It also talks a little bit about collaboration. I had the great good fortune of running the Pentagon press office, as Major Roy said, during the first Gulf War. Some of you may know uh, that the Pentagon press corps actually has offices right across from the, the, the Department of Defense press office. And... Uh, so you got to know those reporters. And your best situation uh, in, in a public role is if you have a beat reporter or a group of beat reporters who are covering your organization. Because first of all, you'll get to know them. They'll get to know some of the intricacies of your profession. Um, and they have to come back to you the next day for the next story. So that if, if they have betrayed a trust or betrayed a confidence, they know that they're going to pay that price. 
So you must go into these relationships, build, build a relationship in advance, know that particular audience. And that also goes with other people on staffs that you're with. I will say in this litigious society, anybody who's involved in public communication, again, primarily with the media, but in other situations, if you've got a legal team, get to know those lawyers. Take them out for a beer. Find out what are the things that are concerning them, what are the things that if you're in a, in a situation, you don't, you don't want uh, to get your organization into any kind of legal hot water. You'll find that a very enlightening conversation and they'll also have your back when you need them the most. My talking points, and I use that term loosely, um, are on page 28 of your notes if you haven't already turned there and you'll see the first one there, as I say, bad news doesn't get better with age. I want to give you two quick examples with that, many applications. Uh, 1976, I'm the Chief of Public Affairs for the 2nd Infantry Division in Korea up on the demilitarized zone. Uh, one of our esteemed brigade commanders, Colonel Andrew Cooley, is giving up command of the 2nd Brigade to come be the Division Chief of Staff, which means that he will be my boss. So Colonel Cooley didn't know me all that well. I didn't know him all that well. But you always want to start out on the right foot with your, with your boss. So being in charge of division communications, which included the division newspaper, The Indian Head, I did this wonderful front page spread on the 2nd Brigade and Colonel Cooley and his coming in to be the new chief of staff. And we printed the paper and distributed it. And the, my Deputy put the paper on my desk, and I was very proud of it, looked at the great photographs, and we identified the brigade as the 3rd Brigade instead of the 2nd Brigade. I didn't know what to do, but I knew that I was in hot water, so I marched from my office up to division headquarters into Colonel Cooley's office. The, somebody was just handing him the newspaper when I got to the office, and I just said, Sir, I got to tell you, we screwed up. And he was, pretty, he was pretty angry, but we got it over with. And I'm happy to tell you, I wouldn't be standing here today if, if, we, if I wasn't able to prove myself uh, and get over that little hiccup. But the, the point is, you got to get that bad news out. Don't let it fester. All right, I'm going to show you the personal side of my helix now. My wife doesn't know I'm going to tell this story, but it, it's illustrative how you can be very professional in your communication, but in your personal life, you can really stub your toe very badly. 2006, I'm working this chemical demilitarization business. I'm in the, I'm in the Denver airport, and I had this fetish about taking off my big VMI ring and my wedding ring that fit alongside it and all my metal stuff because I did not want to set off the metal detector. And so, I, and I had done this many times and my wife had chided me, she said, you don't have to take your rings off and I, I don't want to set off the metal detector. So, I get all my stuff back after going through security and my wedding ring is gone. The ring that she put on my finger 57 years ago yesterday. And I, I felt infinitely worse than I did about Colonel Cooley's 3rd Brigade or 2nd Brigade. But I thought, maybe, maybe we can find it. Maybe I can get another ring made. And so I delayed telling her. And because the VMI ring is, is so large, she didn't immediately notice that my wedding ring was gone. But I stalled, oh, I want to say two or three weeks before she finally said, why aren't you wearing your wedding ring? And I had to fess up. And it was even harder to do that to the wife that I had married than it was to old Colonel Cooley. What I'm trying to say in telling you this story about bad news never gets better with age is this communications function. It's a very personal thing. You may be great as a professional communicator and terrible in a, fa in a family communications setting. And so to quote the immortal Taylor Swift, it's me, 
I'm the problem, it's me. Hi, I'm the problem, it's me. You have to, you have to constantly evaluate yourself in this whole communications business. And we are all quite capable of, of, of making mistakes. Um, we've had at least one speaker, I know that Chief Rader mentioned that she had learned more from her mistakes uh, than she had from the things that, that she was successful at. And this is very, very true. Um, you make a lot of mistakes in this business. You make a lot of mistakes in any business. Uh, shame on you for making the mistake, but double shame on you if you haven't learned from it. I want to tell you a couple of other things. I want to illustrate some of these points with some vignettes. Vignettes, those are little, little stories that uh, emanate from experience. Initial reports of any incident are invariably wrong. And that's become even worse now in this age of instant uh, communication. Um, I listed a book here for you to read. And uh, you may think, well, why, why do I want to read about the sinking of the Titanic, uh, which happened in 1912? Uh, read Night to Remember by Walter Lord. I really encourage you. First of all, it's not a textbook. And secondly, it's a great read for understanding how people react in a crisis. Read in there how the various ship's officers, what they did, how they handled that. Uh, because it's very illustrative. It, yes, that's a crisis that very few of us are going to be involved in, a ship sinking. But it's a crisis nonetheless, a life and death situation. And I think you will find that book very uh, illustrative. It's also illustrative of initial reports are always wrong. Because the first reports that got back to New York was that everybody was saved. And so that caused great consternation when later on down the line, they learned that there was a tremendous loss of life in that, in that sinking. You'll also find out from this kind of book, a lot of the precedents that were set because of that particular tragedy. If you want to know why there is an international ice patrol, Coasties, any Coasties in the room? Uh, you know where that came from. You also, all the rules and regulations about manning wireless and radios on ships that all came from the Titanic disaster. Very interesting book. Uh, a, a, another book about the emotional impact of a crisis that you should read is also Walter Lord. Uh, and the reason that I pick him is because he's passed away now, but when he was writing these books, he interviewed all the survivors. So he got firsthand reports. It's probably the, the freshest history of these uh, crises that you'll ever read. Day of Infamy, the story of the attack on Pearl Harbor. All of us who have a military connection, you want to read that because there were so many mistakes made as a result of miscommunication and misunderstanding. But there's one story in there that really doesn't have that much to do with the communication, but it has to do with the emotional impact of a crisis. So Army nurse, Monica Counter, she was stationed at Hickam Army Airfield, fell in love with and became engaged on the night before Pearl Harbor to a Lieutenant Benning. And Walter Lord paints this wonderful picture of Nurse Counter and her fiance coming out of the Hickam Air Force Base Officers Club. They could see all the lights of Pearl Harbor twinkling on the, on the, uh, on the water. And, and she was so, the two of them were extraordinarily happy, as you, as you can imagine, at that point in their lives. And of course, the next morning, she was doing triage, uh, dealing with this horrible catastrophe of the 2,000 some odd service members who died uh, and many more who were injured in Pearl Harbor. The emotional impact of that positive story, I can tell you that uh, she later went, went on to become quite the poster child for recruiting Army nurses. And she and her husband both survived the war and are buried together in Arlington Cemetery. So read Walter Lord, those two books. You can do it as enjoyment. You have to do it. Don't do it as an assignment. Uh, never knowingly communicate false information. There's also a bullet point there that says, always tell the truth. I probably should have put that at the top of the list because that's extraordinarily important. The credibility that you bring to the table as a communicator, oh, 
you think that has a personal application as well? The, com the credibility that you bring to the table as a communicator rests on your truthfulness, your reputation for integrity. And if you are ever caught in a misstatement, a deliberate misstatement, your credibility is, is gone. Now, sometimes you are going to get false information. That's, I've already said that the initial reports of, of an incident are almost invariably wrong. But if you have the, the relationship with that audience, those reporters in this case, and they already trust you, then if you have to go back to them and say, we did have fatalities, it wasn't just injuries, then they're not going to accuse you of trying to cover something up. They will know that you are coming from the right place, that you're trying to set the record straight. And again, going back to that relationship with re reporters, I had the great good fortune. You remember the first Gulf War, they sent a big meet. Well, you don't remember because you weren't born yet. First Gulf War, they sent a big media pool to Saudi Arabia. So all the principal reporters uh, from the Pentagon all went overseas. And they backfilled with what we called the food reporters because they had to bring in reporters who didn't have that background. One of those food reporters was a young woman whom you may recognize, Katie Couric who backfilled Steve, uh, um, Fred Francis, who went over as the NBC rep. Well, Katie came in to me as head of the press office. She didn't know the difference between a bayonet and a battalion. But I worked with her, gave her a, a rudimentary glossary of terms of what, you know the jargon we all talk about, uh, all the abbreviations and acronyms. Those are very foreign to people who don't live in our little world. I know VMI never uses those, uh, but very important as a communicator that you speak clearly, don't use abbreviations, don't use acronyms. If you have to use an abbreviation, uh, uh, spell it out, very important. Communication is a fundamental aspect of leadership. I, I'm not sure how you can even consider leadership without considering communication and, its, and all of its ramifications. Because you can, you can be decisive, you can have a brilliant mind, you can be able to visualize what's going to happen. But if you can't communicate any of that, if you don't do it well, you're, you're never going to be a leader. So you have to be a good communicator if you're going to be a leader. And there's also a responsibility there that I want to illustrate by a couple of other uh, incidents. Uh, any military academy West Point folks in here? Okay, maybe in the next, next session. Uh, 1979, I am the Deputy Public Affairs Officer at the United States Military Academy at West Point. Uh, the first class of women have just come in and there's tremendous press scrutiny to, at the Military Academy and reports suddenly circulate in the New York Times that some male cadets in some kind of survival training have caused the most squeamish female cadets that they can find to bite the heads off of live chickens as a part of survival training. I don't know whether any of you, I mean, we have cutting instruments, but there was an effort there to show their machismo that I can bite this head off a chicken and you, you need to do the same thing. Well, that got into the press at a time when the military academy was under the great scrutiny with how it was treating women. Superintendent at the time was probably one of the most distinguished uh, soldiers of the 20th century, uh, Andrew Jackson Goodpaster. He was an acolyte of General Marshall's. He was Supreme Allied Commander in Europe. He was also a PhD from Princeton. Uh, he was brought in to the military academy to help them through this difficult time. Very distinguished. When we went to him with this story, we were suggesting a press conference, and he said, I will do the press conference. And he did. And he went out in, in front of quite an array of reporters, and he laid it all down the line. He said, this was a very wrong thing to do. My responsibility, I'm the superintendent. It will not happen again and the story eventually went away. Second incident, Thir the 3rd of July, 1988. Tensions are high in the Middle East. Whoever heard of that? 
the cruiser Vincennes mistakenly shoots down a civilian Iranian Airbus, killing 290 civilians. They thought it was a, a, an enemy aircraft coming at the cruiser. The cru cruiser shot it, shot it down. So I had just taken over the, the press office at that time, and Admiral Bill Crow was the uh, chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff. So I went in to talk to Admiral Crow. Of course, he had already been briefed by his people of, of what happened. I said, sir, we're going to have to talk to the media on this. Would you like me to get the chief of naval operations to uh, head this out? He said, he stopped me right there and he said, no, Monteverdi. He said, I'm the senior admiral on duty. I will do the press conference. And he did. And it was a very difficult press conference. But he could have passed that on to somebody else. He elected not not to do that. So, so when I say that communication, particularly in a crisis public scenario, is a leadership responsibility, that's, that's what I mean. There's an adjunct to that, and that is if you are tasked with being a communicator in an organization, I don't, how, no, I don't know how you get there, if you're a job interviewer or whatnot, but you must demand what I call a seat at the table. You need to be in the inner circle while these decisions are being made. Don't call the public affairs guy into the room after all the decisions have been made and the horses are out of the barn. Let that public affairs person with the experience of being a public communicator weigh in on the decision. There's an old saying that we say, will it play in Peoria? And by that we mean Hey, Peoria is the middle, uh, middle America. If the people in Peoria will feel a certain way about something, maybe that's okay. If the people in Peoria are probably not going to like something, you better look at your policy. And a public affairs person can bring that kind of insight, should bring that kind of insight to that uh, dialogue. However well rehearsed, a crisis cannot be business as usual. And by well rehearsed, I mean you might have all the technical apparatus to monitor a crisis, to dispatch assets and resources to solving the crisis. But don't expect the people at the receiving end of that crisis to think that you're doing what you should do. Great Mississippi River flood in uh, 1993, the year that I retired just a couple of months before I retired. I was Chief of Public Affairs for the Army Corps of Engineers. The Mississippi and uh, Missouri rivers had a terrible flood, uh, ultimately resulted in, in 50 people dead, $16 billion worth of damages. Now, the Corps of Engineers had us an elaborate flood control network, and they have commands all up and down uh, the river. The Chief of Engineers, the three-star, with his two deputy two stars, is in Washington, D.C. And I said to the chief, I said, I know, I know you're getting all the reports that you need. You have your war room in here. We can run the flood flight from here. But you need to send a general officer with his flag to St. Louis because the people along the Mississippi need to know that somebody from Washington, D.C. has got up from their butt and gone out to the scene of wherever the crisis is and is operating from that point. And he took that advice and that did work very well. George Patton ha had that same idea in mind. Did you know that George Patton always went to the front in a Jeep or a command car because, and well marked with his three star flag and his third army flag because he wanted the troops to see him going forward. When he had to go back to his headquarters, he took a light aircraft back, one of these uh, Cessnas of the World War II era, because he did not want the troops to see him going the other way. That's a form of communication right there. It's establishing the responsibility that a leader has in the eyes of his troops or her troops. This is my own makeup but you need to know that it happens more often than not. Your subject matter expert is likely to be on leave when the crisis hits. I can't tell you how many times that that has happened to me. 
uh, in military public affairs, you usually sign out desk officers. Each desk officer has a responsibility for maybe a unit or a particular function. And invariably, when something goes haywire in that unit or function, uh, that desk officer is gone. So you have to cross train your, your people so that each one has a rudimentary knowledge and access to the notes of that uh, particular desk officer. It's, it's like training artillerymen. I have to laugh. I'm a docent at the Army Museum. We have this wonderful uh, display of a Napoleon 12 pounder. Looks very much like some of the cannons that are right around here. Probably the most ubiquitous artillery piece of the Civil War. But there's a gun crew in these cast figures around it. Those gunners trained just like artillerymen train today 150 years later. You form up an artillery section, you line up your number one, your number two, your number three. You go about your drill, you end, you say, okay, number one, you're number two, number two, you're number three, number three, you're number four, and you go through it again until every cannoneer knows the duties of the other cannoneer. So you have to do that if you're running a public affairs office. You've got to cross train everybody and then have faith in them that they all know how to cover those areas. No crisis ever evolves in the way that it was anticipated. This probably almost goes without saying. The military corollary that you've all heard is no battle plan ever survives first contact with the enemy. But you have to have a plan and planning for a crisis is one of the most difficult things that, that you have to do because, first of all, you're consumed every day with the day-to-day -day business of your organization. And it may or may not include anything to do with something going wrong. So you have to spend time as an individual leader thinking about the unthinkable. What could happen? And even if, even if you do no more than think about it, you have at least come to some idea of what might be done if some bad news things happen. Your best case scenario is then to articulate some of those thoughts to your staff, get them together over a beer, and say, what would happen if all our power went out and we didn't have our we couldn't operate our, our computers. What would we do? Where would we go? Do we have a backup generator? Uh, how would we handle that? What would we do if we found out one of our senior managers was caught in some terrible misbehavior? Uh, and you don't have to name any names, but you can just work through who would we contact? Better contact the law, law people quickly. This happens, these things happen all too often, and I would be surprised if the, right here in this room that you don't have to deal with that at some point or another. Some human misbehavior that you have to deal with in a communications standpoint. You've got to think about those things, think about how you're going to handle them, uh, and who are you going to notify? If you have a board of directors in your organization, and something bad happens, do you want your board of directors to read about that in the newspaper or see it in social media? No, you'd better have a quick fire channel to get to them right away so that they are the first to know before anybody else. Also, the people in your organization, you don't want them to hear that something bad in the organization has happened by reading it in the newspapers. They need to hear that from the boss. That's very, very important. So you work these kinds of details out in advance. A lot of work involved in this, in this kind of stuff. I mentioned Grant's Corporal. Anybody heard of Grant's Corporal? You know what that is? Sometimes it's referred to Napoleon's Corporal. It is said, apocryphal probably, but maybe not given General Grant's uh, upbringing. General Grant would have his orders written out, and then he would bring some young soldier, usually a corporal, who could read, and have that corporal read over the order. And then Grant would question the corporal about certain aspects of the order. If, if the corporal could understand the order and could answer the questions, then Grant would have, have it published. If, if the corporal couldn't, then Grant would have it be rewritten until the corporal did understand it. 
So it's very important to have someone in your organization who's not immediately in the communications chain to kind of look over these things, to give you some suggestions that maybe you ought to rephrase this, maybe you shouldn't use this abbreviation. That's a very important uh, aspect. Now here's the thing that's not really has anything to do with communications, but it's something that is attributed to General Marshall that I think is very important, and that is there is no end to the good a person could do if they're not worried about who gets the credit. Think about that. That's an aspect of humility that I think that every good leader has to cultivate. We've seen a little bit of that today in some of our speakers who were quite willing to talk about some of their own shortcomings. And we have to, we have, to have a certain self-awareness about where our weaknesses are and where our strengths are. And we compensate for those weaknesses by, first of all, marrying a great life's partner, um, but others in bringing people together in your staff who have the strengths that you don't have and then make sure that they get the credit for helping solve whatever that problem, whatever that crisis is. Well, there's some other points that I want to uh, talk to you a little bit about that are more directly related uh, to dealing with the media. The first we already talked about and always tell the truth. Let me talk to you a little bit about media interviews. You should never go into a, a, a media interview just cold. Now, sometimes these things happen. You get cornered on the street, but you hope, you, you hope that doesn't happen. Anybody know what a murder board is? Ever heard of a murder board? Yes, sir, I'm sure you have. We, you form a group of people in your organization who develop some really tough questions, and then you sit Whoever's going to be in front of the cameras, you sit them down in front of this murder board and let these people ask these tough questions. Um, we had, I, again, the, when I was running the Pentagon press office, Pete Williams was the Assistant Secretary of Defense for Public Affairs. Some of you may know him uh, because he was the Justice Department correspondent for NBC until just last year. Um, he was Secretary Cheney's a public affairs officer when, uh, when Cheney was a congressman from Wyoming, and then when Cheney came over to take over the Department of Defense, he brought Pete over. Pete was a great, great boss. But the way we worked in those days, and remember this is before social media, so it's a lot less complicated. I'd get into the office at six o'clock in the morning. Uh, I would have, a, I had a brick telephone about this big, uh, the precursor to the little phones that we have now. And I would drive in from, from Vienna, Virginia, with one hand on this brick telephone, driving down 66, and the night people would brief me on all the stories that occurred overnight. And so I would come in fairly well briefed. I would sit down at my own, and the only kind of internet we had is that I could uh, type out things and send it to desk officers who are in the immediate area. I would send out questions to them, the Army desk, the Navy desk, the Air Force desk, Marine desk. And then they would come back to me by a certain time in the morning with answers to those questions. We put them all in a three ring binder. Can you imagine a three ring binder? And then we would go into Mr. Williams' office and, and, and this is on days we had a press conference. The press conference was always at 11 o'clock. We had this, we had this uh, meeting with him at 10 o'clock. And then we would pepper him with these, with these questions and he would look over our answers, modify them or add to them or accept, they always, made us pleased when he accepted the answer that we, that we developed. And then he would go to the podium at 11 o'clock and speak to the press corps uh, with, that, with that three ring binder. But that murder board, that opportunity to ask and answer tough questions is invaluable to a leader when that leader has to go before the, before the cameras. You try to anticipate the, the, tough, the tough questions uh, in advance. An interview is not a conversation. It's not like me just rattling off here. You, you have to think very carefully about what you say. And if you don't want it to be in print, don't say it. Back at the military academy, um, we had some cadets. Well, there was a military police uh, desk sergeant on post at West Point 
who had a brother who wrote for the Newburgh Evening News. Didn't know this at the time. But anything that happened at West Point would get leaked uh, from the desk sergeant out to the brother at the Newburgh Evening News. We had some cadets heading up Storm King Drive, and they just happened to pass a, not a marked military police car, but a plain military police car, and they mooned the military policeman. And that story, first thing I get in, in the morning, the phone's ringing, it's the Newburgh Evening News, and they want me to comment on cadets mooning military policemen. Well, I'm thinking, oh, Lord preserve us. I said, look, you've got to realize, yes, they're cadets. We think the world of them, they're the future of the country, but they're also college kids, and they're quite capable of doing college kids kinds of things. And then I said, and besides, if the window of the car was rolled up, it's called pressed ham under glass. And the reporter laughed, and I thought, oh, I have defused this situation. Whew. What do you think is in the paper the very next day? United States Military Academy spokesman Major Miguel Monteverdi, quote, pressed ham under glass. Well, I was up in front of the chief of staff so fast, and he, he chewed me out as well I deserved to be chewed out, but I will have to say, as I saluted and did my about face, I saw just a little bit of a smile. Just a little. <laughs> so I survived that one too, but the, but the case in point, you don't want to be funny, you don't want to say things that you don't want to see on the front page of the New York Times, so you just don't say them. And you have to think through that because you can slip into those things very, very easily. Now, that's another situation where I think if I had been talking to a reporter that I knew well, um, we could have gotten past that without, because that reporter would have to come back to me the next day, and I'd have to say, hey, I got nothing for you, buddy, after, that, uh, after what you did to me yesterday. In this case, I didn't know the reporter. Um, but that's another, another lesson learned. And that's another thing about there's no such thing as off the record. That's, and you know what that phrase means. It means that you can talk to a reporter and tell the reporter something that is not going to actually appear in the, in the article. That's very dangerous, very thin ice. I'm not going to say that you never talk to a reporter off the record uh, because that I would be giving you misinformation. In the Pentagon press office, uh, because we had these Pentagon reporters there, they would come to me and sometimes they would say, hey, we're getting reports about this unit of the 101st uh, being sent over here. Uh, what can you tell me about that? Well, I could tell them that if they report something like that, it would endanger the soldiers of that particular unit. Or I could just say, I'm not going to tell you anything. Well, if I knew the reporter well and trusted the reporter, I would give them the rationale behind the information so that they would have a buy-in to the security of our... And they, a lot of these reporters are very, very patriotic people. They don't want to get American servicemen and women hurt. So if they understand the rationale behind something and, and you trust them, then you can do that. But, but be very, very careful, be very judicious when you do that. It all comes into the, the relationship uh, that you may be having with that, with that reporter. I've already mentioned, I says, keep it simple. Nothing runs an interview, ruins an interview faster than long, involved uh, explanations. Um, that goes along with the jargon. Don't use that. Uh, Craft in your head or in your notes a, a simple explanation for something. Do it as a sound bite, even if you're not going to be, be interviewed. Um, try to come up with a short sentence that, that can't be edited by a film editor, editor. The longer the sentence that you have, the easier it becomes for them to edit something out. 
uh, maybe something crucial that completely changes the context of that of that sentence. So that's that's a skill that you develop by practice. It's a skill that I learned by mistake uh, that I made. So that's something that you need to, to cultivate. A couple things during an emergency. Of course, concern for people should come first in in any communications that you have. That ought to come from your heart anyway. Um, you don't want to ever come across as cold or uh, dismissive of the grief that somebody is experiencing. Even if they're not experiencing that grief in front of you, you must assume that there, if there's been an accident involving injuries or worse, that there are going to be grieving families out there and you must never, ever, ever come across that you don't know that, that you don't understand that, that you don't empathize with it. And that really need, if you can't do that, you should not be in the communications, public communications business. And I might even say you might not be in the leadership business if you don't have that kind of empathy. And never speculate. Uh, don't ever fall tr uh, to the trap of well, how many people do you think were injured? I don't know. Nothing wrong with saying, I don't know. Don't speculate on something unless you have all the information. Now, I know I am running to the end of my time. There are privacy regulations that you have to be concerned with. That's why you need to get with those uh, lawyers and attorneys and talk to them. But do I have time for any questions at all? One or two questions? Anybody have any? Right here. Yes, ma'am. What recommendations would you give to like concepts in your mind regarding all of the like negative publicity that has been occurring over the past couple of years and everything like that? Like well, I will tell you, it, it, it breaks my heart to see my alma mater caught in that crossfire. Um, but rest assured, VMI will. And, and any of your schools that caught in, get caught in those things, you will rise above that. These institutions are much more resilient sometimes than, than we give them credit for. And VMI will come out the, the stronger. Believe me, there are many colleges in this country who take a deep breath every time they see an article about somebody else's college because it could, the finger could very well point at them. VMI will, will survive that. We'll survive that. Um, and there are lessons to be learned from that. So uh, that's, that's what I have to tell you. Last question. Yeah. Do you have any strategies for dealing with interviewers or people in general that are trying to trap you in questions or like do a hit piece? <clears throat> well, that, I mean, they're out there. You, uh, hopefully, you have identified them uh, in advance. Um, you have to be as truthful as possible. Um, if you have someone else who can be there to uh, back you up in terms of uh, recording what you had to say, um, that can be very helpful. Uh, but it all depends. It's all de dependent on the, on the situation. You can get into a, if your organization has really done something wrong, it becomes a very challenging position, particularly if you've got lawyers whispering in your ear, what you can say. All I can tell you is go with their counsel. Thank you. All right, thank you.